I was not intending to be on the agenda. We had so many other good speakers that I really wanted to yield the floor to other folks, but it also dawned on me this is a good opportunity because I've not had a chance, other than a very limited fashion, to give a presentation on the Short Leaf Pine Initiative itself to a lot of the folks in New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and so forth. So uh, I, th I think this will be a good opportunity for, for me to give you kind of a 101 and the cliff notes. I'm gonna run through it very quickly. Uh, on the initiative and tell you why it was formed, what it's all about, and kind of hopefully that'll pull you in with your state and your agency's uh, objectives and, and see how you fit in the overall plan. Uh, we're a little behind on the agenda if, if you're paying attention to those notes, but we've got some time left because myself and then McCree Anderson has, has given good, really good presentation on landscape scale fire. Uh, George Zimmerman and Bob will talk a little bit about the field trip tomorrow and I'll have some closing comments. And so we've got, we've got plenty of time. We may run just a little bit over, uh, but I may just have a power seizure and keep everybody another 10 or 15 minutes because we're already here. So we'll, we'll just see how that goes. But I want to give you kind of an update on the initiative. And when I became director a couple years ago, I decided I was going to give the same message everywhere. And I wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. One is I didn't want to promote the initiative and explain the initiative different in Arkansas than I did in Mississippi, that I did in North Carolina. I did that knowing there's a reality with a lot of different state agency infrastructure and budgets. Uh, we operate under two Forest Service regions, four Fish and Wildlife Service uh, regions. We operate under numerous joint ventures, numerous LLCs, or landscape co conservation cooperatives, LCCs rather. And so it's extremely, if you laid a GIS map down on the 23 states, it's a pretty busy map. But I wanted to give the same message to everybody because I knew as I came on board as a director and it's been even enhanced since I've traveled around the last two and a half years, that we're managing a system that takes the same inputs and creates the same outputs with very little change, whether it's here in New Jersey or whether it's in Arkansas or Mississippi. You'll see a lot of presenters with a lot of slides from the south and the western part of the range. And that's not a surprise because that management's been going on there for, in some cases, for 20 years or more. So, you know, they, unless uh, John or, or Bob or somebody brings slides to us, we haven't been up here as practitioners ourselves. So a lot of the slides will be skewed to that area, but I'm, I'm continually amazed how you get the same response. You know, you, you thin get sunlight down to the ground, which is a, a necessary component, get prescribed fire in the landscape, reduce that duff layer where you can get that bare mineral soil for the seed to germinate for the short leaf seed, and you're off to the races. And unless it's worn out ag land, you're gonna have a tremendous understory response with herbaceous vegetation and grasses, and, and, it, and it's generally just one thinning and one burning is very impressive, but it takes more than that to, to uh, really get the true response and, and to keep it going. Shortleaf pine has the greatest range of any southern yellow pine species. It goes all the way from East Texas and southeastern Missouri down to Tallahassee, Florida, right where Tall Timbers Research Station is located, all the way up here into the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. There's 23 states where shortleaf pine occurs. Uh, this is one of the famous little uh, L-I-T-T-L-E range maps. And uh, it shows that, you know, it's not common, obviously, in the Miss Mississippi alluvial valley. The soils are too... Uh, uh, too, too wet. Shortleaf doesn't like to have its feet wet. Uh, there's a little bit of shortleaf in Arkansas on Crowley's Ridge. Very unique little system going on there. Uh, does not occur in the Nashville Basin. Soils are way, way too high in calcium. Gets into southern Ohio. What doesn't show on this map is there are remnants in southern Indiana on the ridges going down to the Ohio River. I travel through those all the time. Got some family up here in the Indianapolis area, and there's quite a bit of short leaf mixed in with white pine, red pine, and, uh, and Virginia pine in this area. It's primarily in eastern Kentucky, for the same reasons it's not in the Nashville Basin. It doesn't occur wildly or, or very commonly at all in western Kentucky. And so it's a very large range, some remnant population up in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so it's a huge range. There's no other southern yellow pine species occurs in such a wide uh, in area geographically in terms of site. Uh, this map, many of you are familiar with longleaf pine, and, and this map shows the overlap. And 
Longleaf goes all the way down into to about two thirds of the way down into peninsular Florida and gets right out tight on the coastal plain up through here down in Louisiana and uh, East Texas. What's interesting about this map is not so much the, the, the map itself, but it really puts shortleaf into three distinct ranges. When I look at it as a director, you know, we, we split it in a plan that many of you read into an east, central, and western portions. But where shortleaf overlaps with longleaf, we generally have fairly good timber markets. You may not like the prices, but you can move material for a thinning and a final harvest. You know, you put it out for bid, you're going to get several buyers, potential buyers. We also still have uh, capacity either through consultants or state agencies and NGOs to do a fair amount of prescribed burning. They'll tell you real quick they don't do enough, but coming from states where we don't do much at all, it's a very fire-rich environment in comparison. That leaves the dark green areas of short leaf, and you've got the areas in Arkansas, East Texas, parts of Oklahoma, where you've got a pretty good pine market and a strong culture of prescribed fire. And then there's the rest of us, and, and you all are in it here, I'm in it in Tennessee, I live just west of Chattanooga, Virginia's in it, all these areas where we have oftentimes limited pine markets, so that makes it more challenging to justify the management on private land and even on public land, you're still in the public trust expecting a return at the end of that rotation of the, of the forest. And also we have less prescribed fire. You know, we, it's, le it's out of the culture a little more, both from professionals as well as the general public. So those are kind of the challenges, and I'll, and I'll add into those here further on in the conversation, but I thought this map might help you explain a little bit of how I look at the world as the director of the initiative. Uh, this is where it overlaps with Loblolly. And I realized this morning at breakfast, I missed a golden opportunity to overlap this with pitch pine. But pitch pine basically comes down roughly down through eastern Pennsylvania and, and down through the Appalachians into Tennessee, eastern Kentucky, North Carolina, and back up. We do have it in Tennessee, and uh, I've, I've got it just 50, 60 miles from the house, but there's, it's certainly not to the concentration you have here, and it's tied into the higher elevations. Ron Myers will talk about some issues with hybridization. We'll talk about it on the field trip. You have less of an issue of that here because Loblolly is, is, is a very minor component of south end of New Jersey from what I understand is where it's fairly limited other than planted stands. But where short leaf is, where Loblolly has been planted in areas that were historically pure short leaf, there is some hybridization. Pollen overlaps and uh, and I think Jim mentioned in his presentation earlier today that one way of getting rid of those hybrids is burning at an early age because the, the short leaf will, will sprout and, and recover whereas the loblolly uh, hybrids will be killed out. So there's, there's, a, there's a way to treat that through the prescribed fire. The history of short leaf in the United States, the longleaf folks, and I was heavily involved still at part of the Longleaf Partnership Council. They've done a very good job of promoting longleaf, not just for RT and E species, but also for a lot of other amenities to the public in terms of uh, aesthetics and wildflowers and, and uh, a lot of iconic species such as bobwhite quail. And they really tie in the culture of, of longleaf to those communities and what it meant years ago to the logging community and the local towns and, and, and people that live there and the, and the turpentine extraction that used to take place and so they really tie in the cultural component. Well Shortleaf has got exactly that same story. Clarence is not going to give a presentation here, Clarence Coffee, but he has one where he's dug up historical records in Tennessee and Alabama and Kentucky. Shortleaf has the same story to tell. And up until the 1950s it was the predominant commercial timber species. If you were building stores and businesses and residential homes you were using shortleaf pine. Uh, I had a framing crew I got, went one year to college, got out for three years, had a framing crew, and I know we used to look for, and this is back before we had a lot of the uh, OSB products and some other things, but solid dimension products. If you were looking for joist, plate, and header material, you want a short leaf pine or dug fir. Because it's very dense, very stable, very, very dependable product, took a really good load. So it's a very valuable tr timber tree, and my first experience with short leaf pine was when I came out of school and bought timber, I worked for timber industry, 
and we bought short leaf pine and it was most of the value per acre uh, over, the, over the stands and, and it was very high demand saw timber product. Weighed the same green as red oak. You had, if you had a logger used to load in loblolly pine, he had to be really careful with short leaf pine because it would be an overweight load, very easy. And I, I came out of school and I thought, why did we not do any discussion of this at all other than a dendrology quiz and knowing how to identify it? You know, and it, so that was the big, that was 1985 and that's when I started having an interest in short leaf pine. Very rich history that's yet to be told. And Clarence and some others with Southern Regional Extension Forestry are working on that very part of the process. It was very common and it was, a, uh, it was the default pine tree of the landscape over much of the, uh, the eastern United States. And the reason it was, it was fire. And all the way back to the Native Americans that intentionally set fire, you had lightning fires. We had fire on the landscape range wide in this country. We can't even comprehend now. You know, if, if we were successful in prescribed burning in every one of the 23 states, we'd never approach the level of what used to take place historically. Started with Native Americans, they understood the value for wildlife habitat, protection from their villages, their hunting land. Uh, lightning fires would burn and they'd burn until they ran out of fuel or hit a major river or precipitation event. And you'd have this mosaic where shifting winds, you know, it burned, you get a southwest wind and it push it to the northeast and it'd just really rip and snort from, you know, noon until four o'clock in the afternoon and lay back down when the humidity came up. And then at night the wind would shift and take off and go another direction and sometimes it'd go out and just this, this mosaic we couldn't even comp put together in a computer program was what used to occur on the landscape. Well, it favored short leaf because Virginia pine was killed out very easily as a, as a seedling. And it was relegated to the rocky ground and the bluffs, pitch pine to the higher elevations, in, in the southeast anyway. Loblolly was easily killed. It ended up being down in the, in the wetter ground. I mean, historically, it was always down in the low ground, the not, not wet ground like bottomland hardwood ground, but wet ground for pine. It liked it to be in damp conditions. And the short leaf could sprout. And so this frequent variable fires came through and they were absolutely the perfect recipe to have short leaf and mix short leaf pine, oak, hickory woodlands across the landscape. It's very common in historical records. So that was the good times. And here's an example of sprouting. This is uh, Jim Goulden had a picture earlier. Uh, here's the basil crook. And I know landowners have bought seedlings and had that and have called their state forester and said something's wrong with these seedlings. <laughs> They've been damaged in the nursery. Well, it should have that. And that's where it sprouts. This is Lauderdale Wildlife Management Area where it withdrew Nick's two years ago, I guess, and took these pictures. They inherited some industrial forest land that had a lot of loblolly seeding in. And, and, and I had that problem when I was a consultant in, on industrial land with Virginia pine as well. Well, they ended up having an arson fire, and it killed a lot of the loblolly and sprout and shortly sprouted back, and they said, wow, we just figured something out here. And now they use fire as a tool to, with a plant short leaf, and if, if they're trying to keep a predominantly short leaf uh, hardwood forest and keep the Virginian loblolly pine, pine out, they, they use fire. But that's a three-year-old sapling that is re-sprouted. So a lot of things occurred and put the decline to short leaf pine. Uh, there's loblolly interest, you know, and I was an industrial forester. You know, if I get a bad cut to this day, I bleed loblolly sap. And I was really proud of what I did, still proud of what I did. It produced a lot of wood, a lot of fiber on, on a minimal amount of ground, very intensive management. Longleaf was the new kid on the block 20 years ago. You know, all the focus was on, lob, on longleaf. So the focus was off of shortleaf. A lot of the research quit. In the meantime, we cut a lot of shortleaf pine out, pr pr primarily in mixed stands, but we didn't have enough sunlight down to the ground to regenerate it. If we did have some regeneration, the canopies closed together, we didn't have any prescribed fire, and so we basically took the shortleaf out of the equation, lost it out of the canopy, there was no future seed source, bingo, shortleaf's gone. Okay, and that's what's happening in a lot of the areas. But the fire regime really changed it. And a lot of times we talk about Smokey the Bear. It was a needed event, greatest marketing thing in history. And it did a lot of great things, still does. But that lack of fire was not good to shortleaf, and I would argue that even a greater impact was not that policy by states and federal government, but it was the loss of the, or the, the 
fence laws that were put in place across a lot of the range. Because until then, a lot of landowners burned across the landscape for forage in the woods and in the pastures and fields that were within those areas. And you know, if I burned and it got across on Dana's property, you know, he didn't he didn't run over on a horse or in a car and chew me out. He thanked me because he's getting ready to burn it tomorrow. I mean, it was a whole different mindset of, of landscape scale and the, and the value of fire. And the fence laws coming in all of a sudden started to parcel up the properties and it made where fire crosses that line, it's not necessarily good. So a lot of things changed that, that were bad for short leaf. Uh, this is a map. This black line is that same little map, the historic range. The red dots are FIA plots where shortleaf occurs. It's a yes or no map. This has got nothing to do with diameter, classification, anything else. This is a yes or no, and you can see a lot of this is in Arkansas, southeast Missouri, gets down in east Texas, Louisiana, all the way down the coastal plain. Here's that, those stands around tall timbers that everybody's looking at the longleaf. All, all, all I ever see when I'm down there is a shortleaf all up through the Appalachians, all the way up into New Jersey. It's not in the Black Belt Prairie area, and it's not in the Nashville Basin, and here's those little stands in Indiana. So that's a very interesting map, shows an occurrence. It's a yes or no, but the acreage, if you take FIA data, they classify timber types. You take just the top two categories, shortleaf pine, shortleaf pine oak, and shortleaf occurs in 14 categories, so this is not capturing all the acres but we did that to compare apples and apples with the Longleaf Initiative because they just used the top two uh, types. It's declined 53% since 1980. A lot of us, that's in our career time. I mean, it's literally disappearing in front of our eyes. Probably the only faster decline is Bob White Quail. This is a state-by-state -state breakdown, 2012 data, and it's alphabetical. And it's those two types, the blue is shortleaf pine, the red is shortleaf pine oak. And you can see the relative relationship. What this doesn't show, this shows gross acres. It doesn't show quality, value, you know, whether it's mostly regeneration, age of the stands, or anything else. This is just acreage right there by state. And it's, it's not a fair fight because when you take states like New Jersey and Delaware and some of these others, they don't have near the base acreage of, of other states. So, you know, if, if this graph was changed on the axis, you could, you could see some of these other states and their resources just as important, but it's hard to show up on a graph this, with this scale system. 68% of the acreage is west of the Mississippi. Most of it probably always was, but the greatest losses have been east of the Mississippi. 34% Arkansas alone, okay? So that, that, that trend carries pretty much across the range and has historically, but I can't overemphasize, and you'll see in these next things, that most of the loss is not in those states, it's, it's the other one. So it was more of a balance years ago. This, you're probably not going to be able to see it from the back, back but the take home message is every single state in the last 32 years of this FIA data, and, it's, and that trend continues, it's not getting better, has had a negative loss of shortleaf pine. It's disappearing, okay? And even states like Alabama and Arkansas and others in here that you think, you know, we're never gonna lose this resource, they've had huge losses themselves. So it's, nobody's escaping this. Nobody's, nobody's doesn't have to worry about uh, the loss of shortleaf pine. In spite of what Jim said, Arkansas still had a big, a big list. We can argue that over, over the hospitality suite later. We lost half the acreage, six million acres, that's 52%. And I've got a kind of a simple mind. I, I thought six million acres is a lot of land and I like to translate it into a rate of loss. And I did the math one day sitting at a restaurant and I had to do it about three times because I thought surely this is not right. But it is, 22 acres an hour range wide, we're losing that component across the system. And that, that's incredible rate of loss. That's a section of land in a day. You know, so it's disappearing literally like sand through our fingers. Just, and that rate of loss is increasing. So why short leaf? Jim touched on this, and this is the most common question I get. And I get it from an audience, and I get it from a lot of fellow foresters and biologists who at the break or a week later, they call me on the phone and say, okay, Mike, I saw your presentation, all that, and that's great. 
I understand you're passionate about it, but why in the world would I be interested in short leaf pine? And these are some of my basic answers to that question. They don't cover all of them. But one, it's a declining species and ecosystem. If you're in natural resources, that ought to be a concern in itself because once it's gone, it's gone. You can't manage something that's no longer there. You know, you can't understand it. You can't understand how it affects other species when it's gone. So for that very reason, if nothing else, you should be concerned about it. It's a wide range, tremendous opportunity. It is incredibly good saw timber. You know, and that and the longleaf folks, I don't think we promote that enough. It's really, really good material. It's the ponderosa pine. It's the dug fir of the east. It's great stuff. It's a better fit for saw timber and less on pulpwood on a lot of public and private lands. And, and it's not that people aren't interested in pulpwood rotations, but a lot of landowners and a lot of public land are interested in a longer rotation. Carry it further. You know, open it up, keep fire in the ground, get sunlight to the ground, manage it intensively, intensively for wildlife habitat, and extend that rotation age out. It's a really good fit for that. Uh, short leaf's not always in pure stands, okay? And that's one of the things that, that is hard for foresters to, to grasp because in school we're, we're trained to either manage oak and hardwood forest and that type of civic culture or pine plantations or, or, or solid heavy, heavily stocked stands and natural pine. You know, nobody ever talked about mixed stands and that's a challenge, but for a lot of private landowners and a lot of public land, that's fantastic management. You know, it, it, if you have fire in there and sunlight, you know, and you've got a mix of southern red oak and pitch pine and short leaf pine and, and uh, it's, and white oak and post oak and hickories and all that in there together, you've got a very diverse system. Fits ecosystem management very well in public lands, and it fits changing ownership objectives for most private landowners. Uh, I'm a past consultant. There's several consultants in the room. I was a consultant for 11 years, and even years ago, I could count on one hand with fingers left over the number of landowners that ever wanted me to really get into the nit and gritty on their internal rate of return and land expectation value and all those things. They knew what their opportunity cost was. They didn't have that land for timber. They, they wanted to make money. They wanted to buy gravel, pay surveying fees, pay consultant fees, uh, do a lot of neat things on the ground with that income. But their primary driver was legacy, pride of ownership, and wildlife habitat, both consumptive and non-consumptive and short leaf management fits into that perfectly. Long rotation, open it up, high aesthetics, high wildlife value. It's a good option on poor to fair sites. <clears throat> you know, in much of the range, <clears throat> I'm still learning about sites here from Bob and, and, and John and a lot of folks in this area, but in a lot of the range, landowners have good ground, riparian areas for hardwood, north and east slopes for hardwood, bottomlands for hardwood, They've got some fairly rich soils that are real good if they want to plant loblolly for a fast return, okay? But they've always got that ridge top and that west and south aspect that's dry and, and doesn't grow good hardwood timber. And, and historically, nobody knows what to do with that. Well, you go out there and there's three or four short leaf, relic short leaf to the acre, legacy from past management decades ago, and hickories and southern red oak and post oak, and I know now exactly what to do with that. You know, get a little bit of timber revenue off there to pay for drip torch fuel and put that into wildlife habitat on a long rotation. Great opportunity. Uh, has short, narrow crowns, very resistant to ice damage because of that and wind throw. Uh, very strong tree. It's not that it, it's not storm proof, but it withstands that better than loblolly. So there's some real advantages of that from a long term basis. Four years, four locations back in 2000. And 13, ending up in Waretown, just north of here in June of 14, we had some stakeholder workshops because from the Huntsville Conference in 2011, we realized we needed to have a range-wide plan. We needed to have that so state agencies could anchor to it, so the Forest Service could anchor to it, so the JVs could anchor to it, so the state wildlife action plans could anchor to, anchor to it, state resource, forest resource plans. Everybody needed something to point their plan to and tie it in, particularly under ecosystem management. So we pulled stakeholders in, had four workshops in preparation for restoration plan, which was released a year ago this past summer. It's been out since 2016 in July, uh, approved in the spring by the advisory committee. And it's, it's, it's our first plan, it's good for five years. 
You've got, we've got hard copies out there. You're welcome to. They're on uh, PDFs on your, on your lanyards, on the jump drive. And it's a basic plan to get us out the gate. And uh, a lot of people attended those stakeholder meetings. We didn't have a lot of data on short leaf, but we had to start somewhere. You know, a lot of times going down a path, you've got to lean forward and the next step comes. A little timeline, uh, we started March 2013, that's when we we're official. And the plan was released in 2016 and we're down there at the bottom here in New Jersey at this conference, so a lot has happened. We've had a lot of workshops, over 160 workshops and meetings on short leaf pine across the 23 states just since 2013, uh, impacting a little over 4,000 professionals. So we've had a lot of work going on promote the initiative and we're very much still in that phase. The restoration plan is broken down into some key components and McCree Anderson's coming up next. He and Doug's owner with Arkansas Nature Conservancy were the facilitators and the plan writers uh, or one of many of the plan writers for the restoration plan and these were key components that stakeholders felt were important. You know, you've got to have partnerships. It's public land and private land are two totally different issues on, on where you move forward with the initiative and how you go about it. Economics, you've heard that already, that's an important thing. Ecological sustainability. You've got to communicate and outreach and train professionals. We're still very much in that mode. Not so much working with landowners yet, but training professionals. Because if you have a room like this, even in places that a lot of you may think everybody knows everything about short leaf, you know, if I go down to Alabama where Drew's from, or I go to North Mississippi, you know, and, and ask foresters and biologists in the room to raise their hands if they've ever cut short leaf, planted short leaf, burned short leaf, done anything, there might be three or four hands go up and about this high, right back down. You're not alone. So there's that comfort level and that training and expertise takes training professionals first, demonstrating on public land, and then you can make that easy step to private landowners because then you've done it. You see how it works. There's a lot of threats to short leaf. Uh, you know, the world is definitely not perfect to short leaf pine either. The altered fire regime is a huge uh, uh, conversion of intensive blah blah. That's a major issue from a hybridization and also a land use thing in the south. But it too provides important service to society. But that's just a threat to short leaf when we look with tunnel vision on. It's genetic swamping, conversion to suburban and other non-forest uses. That affects all of us in forest management every day. Uh, poor markets, southern pine beetle outbreaks, particularly in unmanaged stands. You can mitigate most of that by open stands and, and having a, uh, aggressively growing timber and prescribed fires. So uh, the real threat and a lot of the loss of short leaf historically in many areas has been from unmanaged, extremely heavily stocked stands that really uh, lend themselves for a, a pine beetle outbreak. Some barriers, we didn't have a plan, but we do now. A lack of funding and personnel for prescribed fire. Remember that map, how I split it up early on, there's still a lot of us, a lot of short leaf range, we're, we're just getting our feet wet on prescribed burning and, and getting that going on state and federal land and it's, and it's harder to get done on private land. Uh, limited seedling supply, we can plant, we've got plenty of seed but 20 or 30 years ago, a lot of state nurseries closed. Seed orchards were cut down and rogued out. So we, we're pretty good on seed, but the seedling production hasn't caught up. We can plant around six to 8,000 acres a year right now. That's a drop in the bucket. You know, we can't plant our way out of this loss, but that's gonna be part of the equation. Our best opportunity is, is working with public and private land that has some component of short leaf in the overstory. You don't have to have enough for the classic civicultural seed tree harvest or shelter wood. You just have to have some remnant relics there. Get sunlight down the ground, get fire on the landscape, and you'll have that regeneration. Costs you very little money, instant, instant, uh, instant gratification if there is a such thing in forestry and wildlife habitat can come from that scenario. And a lot of f f fundamental research quit. You know, you gotta go back to old black and white hand type research papers when you dig them up in the archives on short leaf pine. It all just stopped in, in, in the 60s and 70s, so a lot of changes. Um, get through that. Next steps, what we're doing here, building partnerships, collaborating with other professionals. That's, that's the value of this conference is getting everybody together range-wide. And, and today's just the first of three days of that opportunity. Site-based conservation. 
I tell everybody, remind them, this is the right tree in the right forest in the right place. It doesn't belong everywhere. The worst thing we can do as professionals is make it fit somewhere. You know, look, look at the historic range, look at the soils, look and see if short leaf's still present on the site. You know, if you have those things, you're, you're good to go, but don't plant it everywhere. It's not a magic or silver bullet. And a strategic and adaptive approach. Learn from one another. You know, everybody in this room is an expert and, and nobody's an expert on short leaf pine. We're all learning every single day from other professionals on, on this tree. It, it's, it's a southern yellow pine and civiculturally it responds pretty much the same, but, the, but there's some unique differences. We've got an advisory committee. We've met three times. Uh, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, NRCS, you, mo you recognize most of these. Uh, acronyms, National Association of Conservation Districts, uh, Nature Conservancy, National Wild Turkey Federation, Chris Coxon's here. Chris, where'd you go? There he is, right there in front. American Forest Foundation, Chris Irwin will give a presentation Thursday. Southern Group of State Foresters, a very active group. Uh, Southeastern Association of Fish and Wildlife, we've got Quail Forever involved, uh, private consultants. We need to get more partnerships developed up in this area. And, and one of the, this is not just a southern species. When you cross out of Region 8 with the Forest Service and go into Region 9, you know, that's been a hard political barrier that we need to try to ignore as an initiative and make that step right across it just like it's a little creek crossing. Because if we don't, it leaves a lot of these other states out that are in the short leaf range and we just focus on, on the states in the southern group of state foresters range and that'd be a huge mistake. So we've got a lot of, lot of building to do with that. Final thoughts, manage it for the objectives of the landowner and the land. Bob mentioned that. You know, that's our role is to meet objectives. Uh, manage short leaf on the proper sites. Be realistic in your expectations. Measure twice and cut once. I said I used to be a carpenter. That's one of my favorite sayings. Generally, if you get in a hurry, something goes wrong. Give priority to existing stands. And it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. I'd rather we do 10,000 acres a year of restoration as a group and do a crackerjack job and look back and be really proud of it than do 50,000 acres and not do it correctly or do it on the wrong site or, or start work and not finish it or not maintain it. I had a conversation with John Stivers who got, got a spot on the program Thursday and, and he made a comment last night at dinner that couldn't be more true. Don't lose your good sites. Don't lose your good ground. You know, don't keep expanding what you're trying to do and lose your demonstration sites and your best opportunity. Those should always be top priority first. And with that, that's it. We've got a website, shortleafpine.net. Uh, we've got some folks from Southern Regional Extension Forestry, Brent Peterson in the back with a camera. Holly's, in, is that Holly in the back room? Don't have my glass. We've got them, they, they do a phenomenal job maintaining the website. They're based out of the University of Georgia in Athens. Uh, that's my email address. And uh, with that, might have time for one question, but I'll be here the whole time. And to the folks in not just New Jersey, but Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Virginia, all the adjoining states, I do not give priority to any states. It'd be real easy for me living in Southeast Tennessee to focus on what's an easy drive and an easy trip. I don't do that. What I actually do is probably discriminate, discriminate against Arkansas because it's all going on there. Why in the world would I go there just to have a sandwich and get a picture? You know, I don't need to be there. I need to be here. So anytime any of you, and I talked to some of the folks from Pennsylvania, if you need assistance getting a workshop put together, training with your staff, or just meeting and looking at on-site stuff, call me because the first one on the calendar wins. Okay, so with that, is there any questions?